A lot of my investors, they love what they do, but they're looking for that other income. They're looking to put their money soldiers to work. Those are people that I hope to serve. So I would say find an asset class that really resonates with you and then go on, go on the education side. You don't need a PhD to take action. Do you love your job, but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks? If so, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. I am your host, Justin Dixon, and we've got a really awesome show with Tim Lyons coming up. He is a registered representative with a broker dealer, which really means he's an ultra capital raiser for multifamily self-storage, industrial triple net leases. He's still a full-time lieutenant in the New York City Fire Department. So we dig into his journey from a working two jobs, uh, another one as a nurse, to leaving the nursing job just before COVID and really launching into real estate. Packed with a lot of information about the market. He's partnered with his brother, Greg, on Cityside Capital. We dig into his journey through building that business after starting with a triplex and raising over $250 million over the last three years. So lots to dig into. So let's welcome Tim to the show. All right, Tim, man. Hey, welcome to the pod. Happy to have you on. Justin, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. So let's just kind of jump right in here. Give kind of my audience a little overview of who you are, what you're doing, and how you got into real estate. So I'm Tim Lyons. I am 40. I'm a married father of three little girls, 12, nine, almost four. But anyway, I still work as a New York City firefighter, and I have now become a licensed capital raiser with my company, Cityside Capital. We're registered representatives of a broker dealer that focuses solely on commercial real estate. But more specifically, Justin, we do a lot of multifamily self-storage and industrial syndications. So with that being said, I'm happy to talk about anything else. Yeah, no, I think let's kind of start at the beginning. So how does the fire department work? Are you full time, like 40 hours a week? Or is it like 24 hours on 24 hours off kind of a thing? Like, how does that all work? Yeah, so it is a funky schedule. But generally speaking, it's 24 hours on followed by say two and a half to four days off. Got it. There's overtime if you want it or something like that, you could do all sorts of swaps. So it's a very amenable schedule to having two jobs or two careers. Yeah. Before I got into real estate, I was a ER nurse in a level one trauma center for nine years. But then I basically, Justin, got caught in the daily grind, 70, yeah. 800 hour weeks. Life was good, nothing really to complain about. I had a pension to look forward to, health benefits, everybody was healthy. Retirement accounts were getting contributed to, bills were paid, two vacations a year. I mean, yeah, everything was great, but I didn't have my time. And that's when I really got into focusing on real estate as a different avenue. When and how did that start, right? Because obviously, a lot of people that listen to this podcast and other people that want to get started, or maybe they don't even know that they want to get started in real estate, whether it's active or passive, they kind of have this moment of, wait, there's something else out there. Let's talk about kind of how that evolution happened from working 100 hour weeks to being like, what can I do to get my time back? So the way I grew up very modestly and scarcity mindset based and the t- traditional work hard, get your paycheck. If you can get a pension, even better. You right. know, max out your 401k, try to pay cash for a house. Like, look, I mean, I love my mom and dad. They tried their best, right? They tried to do all the good things and yeah. show us the way, right? But when I was in my, I guess, early 30s, mid 30s, I started to feel it, right? I mean, like, I was just crushing hours at work and well, I'm not allergic to it. I like to work overtime. I like to right. do extra gigs. But it became something that it wasn't conducive to my lifestyle, put it that way. I wanted more time freedom. I was realizing that I couldn't save my way to wealth. It just wasn't going to happen. Like I was all over the calculators. I was all over the spreadsheets. I've always been a a personal finance kind of nerd, if you will. So it came down to two things. I started to get educated the summer of 2019, ravenously going through books, audio books, podcasts. And by the end of the summer, I realized I needed equity equity in the form of owning a business or real estate. And real estate seemed more attractive. So I got started with the three family property. um, And that really opened up the door to my real estate journey. Our paths are very similar in the sense that growing up, your parents teach you kind of their financial philosophy, right? And a lot of times it's the same, get a good job. Hopefully that has a pension and or, you know, you've got enough money stashed away so that when you retire at 65, you can 
retire comfortably, right? Whatever that means. So that's kind of how I started in the same thing. We started around the same time. Mine was the summer of 18 that we kind of had the mindset shift. You started with threeplex, we started with the duplex. So similar trajectories as far as kind of getting started. So at what point did you find out that you were like, okay, I want to kind of shift away from the 100 hour a week kind of working for money, right? Trading your time for money to building kind of long-term wealth and investing in real estate. And then let's talk about that first deal. How did you find it, finance it, like talk through that? Because obviously you were still working arguably two jobs, at least one and a half. Oh yeah, no, I was firmly working two jobs at the time. My wife was very supportive, but also a little skeptical. At yeah, right. time. So I was scared, right? I'm from New York, right? You're guilty till proven innocent. Like I'm just, I'm that guy. Okay. <laughs> you know? So I didn't want to do a single family because I was just nervous. So I, I looked at duplexes and triplexes and it wasn't in my backyard. It was about an hour away from my house and did it with a friend because I wanted okay. to de-risk the transaction. So he was very on board with me in the same mindset. So we found this three family basically on the MLS. This was end of the summer of 19. We closed on November of 19 and very quickly rehabbed the first floor unit. It was a three-story, one apartment right. per floor, two beds, one bed. And we did a renovation on the first floor and we started cash flowing from day one. And we bought it through an LLC, right? Because okay. we looked at the pockets forums, you know, the right. personal name, you know, what do you do and all the pros and cons. And we were nervous. So we said, you know, let's do an LLC. Yep. But then we found out we had to do commercial financing, right? So we had a 10-year note with a 20-year amortization schedule. Okay. And it was at four and a half percent. And at the time, uh, it was okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was about 100 basis points higher than a traditional 30-year mortgage for a personal residence. So yep. that's what we did. We cash flowed from day one, three, 400 bucks a month, did better on our taxes. And then all of a sudden, like I had proof of concept. My wife had proof of concept. Okay, this is going to work. And then I'm like, man, like this thing is built in the 1920s. Like it's a CapEx tsunami. And I was also working a third job. Like my wife would be like, Tim, this is great. I'm so happy that you're happy doing this and everything, right. but you're mowing the lawn, you're snow blowing, you're raking the leaves, you're doing all the things. And I wanted that education. I wanted to do it firsthand, but if she was right. So I ended up leaving my nursing job to okay. go head first into real estate, February of 2020, right before COVID. And I also realized that I wanted to do something bigger. I wanted to either do more triplexes, but I was scared of the vintage, the age. And I also didn't love being a landlord. So I thought about commercial real estate, but it sounded complicated. Spreadsheets, mm -hmm. that operating income, cap rates, I mean, above the line, below the line expenses, like all right. this stuff. So I ended up getting mentored by a commercial real estate group and kind of just really learned. And that was literally as COVID was coming on our shores. So now I'm like, oh, great. I just left my second career as a nurse. So I'm down that income. Right. right. Now it's COVID. Everybody's scared to death. No one's going anywhere. We're locked in our houses. No one's buying or selling real estate. And oh, yep. by the way, the stock market went down by 30% yesterday. So right. heck of a time to do that. But I really leaned into it. I stayed the course with the education and ended up partnering with my mentor on a 43 unit in Pennsylvania. Okay. So that was really my first foray into syndication and multifamily. And at the end of that process, I got a front row seat on how to do and how it all works. Yeah. He said, you know, Tim, do you want to give Raising Capital a shot for this deal? I said, Chris, I'm like, I don't know if I can bring you $5 or $5 million. I have no idea. So <laughs> right. I literally yeah. had a website. I didn't have anything. I had a Gmail account and a bunch of friends and family and college roommates that I knew had money. And I just gave it a shot, right? Yeah. So anyway, I ended up raising 150000 for that first deal. And that's when it clicked that I could probably make a business around this because it was something that people were really intrigued by and they didn't know about it. Even the yeah. most successful people have now told me, like, Tim, how did Tim the Fireman, Tim the ER nurse get me involved in this? How did I not know about it? How come my yeah. financial advisor never told me about this? And so I saw that they're there and that's where Cityside Capital was born and ended up partnering with my brother, Greg. And that's how we got started. Yeah, there's a lot there that I want to unpack. I want to kind of start with the syndication. So who found that deal? And then you were kind of brought in to kind of peek behind the curtain, right? As your mentor was kind of taking that deal down, because it is much more different to underwrite a 100 unit or a 40 unit, a complex versus a two or a three unit, right? 
But I guess, how did you kind of brought in on that deal? Like, I'm assuming he found it and then you kind of helping and watching and also raising a little bit of money. So my mentor, Chris, he was actually moving to that area. He's looking for a primary residence for him and his family. He couldn't help himself but look at the commercial assets in the area as well, right? So he ended up getting that under contract. So he and I had hit the ground running, great relationship. And he really gave me the opportunity of a lifetime to basically peek behind the curtain, see how it works, right? How does the financing work? How to do diligence work? How does getting insurance? How does raising capital and all that stuff, right? PPM, subscription documents, like all things that I was never privy to. And when I got to see it, and to me, it was magical, but I was like, you know, this could serve a lot of people. And I wanted to scream it from the mountaintops. So I invested in that deal, right? It closed August of 2020, right? So literally it was still locked down. Yeah. The summer of like not a whole lot going on, right? And that was a $5.7 million deal. And I, I raised just a little bit of money for it, put in my own money. My brother Greg put in his money. Yep. And that deal has been paying us every month 7% on our capital ever since. So that's how we got to start. And very quickly, the law of the first deal kicked in, Justin. And we then partnered with another group on 144 units in Greenville, South Carolina. About a month after that, we did 148 units in Sarasota, Florida, and it's been off to the races ever since. Awesome. Well, I want to take a quick sponsor break, and then when we get back, we'll talk about kind of what you're doing now and kind of the difference about the registered representative. I want to dig into that a little bit. We'll be right back. Whether you're trying to hire a full-time employee or a contractor to fill a gap, Hire Tomorrow can help. Hire Tomorrow is a boutique recruitment firm that has successfully filled sales and marketing, human resources, and technology positions with companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500. If you're struggling to find the right talent, check out HireTomorrow.com or reach out to recruiting at HireTomorrow.com to see how they can help. All right, we are back on the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. We've got Tim Lyons. So we kind of walk through kind of the beginning part of the story, and it sounds like the snowball is starting to roll downhill after the 43 unit you mentioned you got into a few other bigger deals. So you mentioned in the beginning that you're a registered representative. So explain that and maybe the difference between a traditional syndicator. All right. So when you raise capital, you can't just raise capital for any sort of deal and not have a material participation in the running of that deal, the taking down of the due diligence, legal, signing as a key principle, something you have to be a part of that general partnership or else you're raising capital without a license and that is considered fraud. Right. Right. So we had to make a decision like, hey, we're good at raising capital. Let's create a business around that and let's get our licenses so that we don't have to raise capital and maybe get in trouble with the SEC because we weren't exactly right. real about that. Yeah. So we ended up finding a broker dealer and a broker dealer is just nothing more than <laughs> Fidelity or Vanguard or Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. Those are all broker dealers in some yeah. sense, but they deal with stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, right? So my broker dealer is a commercial real estate focused broker dealer. We do syndications for multifamily, passive investments, self-storage and industrial. So basically what that means is we connect our relationships with equity, with limited partners, also 1031 exchanges, institutional capital with the operators that we have fully vetted and have got, undergone a due diligence process with. Because at the end of the day, Justin, as you know, as a limited partner, if you're a busy W2 guy, gal, engineer, doctor, whatever, you don't maybe know how to do due diligence. You don't know the questions to ask. You don't have the time to understand that operating income and all the things. But what you do know is that you want to preserve your capital. You want your capital to grow and you want to do it in a tax efficient way. And what I found was that your financial advisor was not going to be telling you about this because they cannot take any fees or AUM privileges with this type of capital. So that's basically in a nutshell what we do. Yeah. I talk to a lot of people that when I talk to about what I do and they seem interested in like investing in real estate, they're like, well, let me talk to my advisor. And, you know, their advisors really can't recommend to invest in something outside of they offer, right? So there's kind of this, they don't want to take money out of their pocket, the AUM, because that's what they get commissioned off of, right? The financial advisor. So you're kind of needing to go outside of their advice because again, they can't really legally, I think, give you kind of actual advice on a syndication or anything like that. 
I guess, how do you find the deals? So like, if so, you're not actively underwriting or searching for deals, you're more or less working with a few or a number of operators that are out there hunting down these deals. So maybe talk about how you get brought into deals and then what your vetting process is to make sure that you feel comfortable taking that information, that deal to your investors. Yeah. So like we were talking about in the beginning, so I work with a group of nine operators, right? Okay. So there's nine operators spread out across the country, different markets, right? And usually it's markets that are business friendly, landlord friendly, population yep. growth, job growth, all the boxes that need to get checked for where we want to be investing our dollars. And we do a deep dive into the companies, right? So the companies that we work with are all established companies, all have a track record, all have experience of about a decade or more. And they find the deal, they do the acquisition, they do the debt financing. But when it comes time for the equity piece, listen, there's more deals than there are equity, right? And a lot of these guys, their their strong point may not be raising capital. It's just right. not. Their strong point is asset management and acquisitions, right? So they'll come to us and say, hey, listen, we have a deal under contract or under LOI. I think we need to raise 15, 17, 12, whatever it might be, 12 million bucks. Can you guys help us out? Yeah. So then they'll give us a package of documents with like the T12, P&L statements, the rent roll, their underwriting, any sort of data analytics like CoStar reports, Yardi Matrix reports. And we have an in-house underwriting team that'll go through that package and we'll have an investment committee meeting about whether we're going to work this deal or not work this deal, or some of us might, some of us won't. There's 19 groups like myself on the broker deal platform. We've raised 250 million over the last two years. So to answer your question, the first party question, how do we vet the deals or, or the operators? They have to pay a certain amount of money to even be underwritten by our broker dealers. And what that entails is going through their past deals, going through their past underwriting. Our lead broker dealer will fly across the country and go meet them for a couple of days because we want to do business with people that we know, like, and trust. And yeah. we're really kind of shouldering that suitability for our investors on the front end. We also, just so we're not having too narrow focus, we have a third-party due diligence firm called CrowdCheck. And CrowdCheck will actually go through, make sure the LLCs are set up correctly, that they own the properties that they say they own, that they owned and sold the properties that they say they sold. Really making sure that the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, because in this day and age, right, you want to trust but verify. Right. And that's kind of the service that we bring to the investors. Interesting. And so you've got to do a very or even in the syndicator has to do a pretty lengthy due diligence process or provide information so that it gets past kind of stage one of the vetting process. And then your team kind of does the underwriting, re-underwrites the deal, making sure you trust their numbers, right? Trust to verify. And then is there a minimum or a target amount that you will raise, right? So sometimes if they need to raise 15 million, do you say, hey, we'll take all of that? Or do you say, hey, we'll take a million or how does that work? So usually like for a first time raise, the brand new operator will take maybe 25% or a third of their total raise, right? Because we want to show a good faith that we're here and we can say we're going to do what we say we're going to do, but we also don't want to be the only game in town with the equity. Yeah. Right? But usually on deals three, four or five, if they needed 10 million, we might take the majority of that. In truth, these operators that we work with, they can raise tens of million dollars by themselves. Right. But they're doing velocity of deals or they're doing bigger yeah. deals. Investor bases can get maxed out or just becomes onerous to, to raise capital. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're, especially that. in the last couple of years with the amount of deals that were going on within the multifamily world, it was capital was there. But sometimes you were like, oh, crap, I invested in deal one. I don't have enough money right now to do deal two. Right. Because it came so quick. So they lean on your expertise and your network to kind of bridge that gap, if you will. And then you mentioned that you do multifamily storage, and I think there was something else that you mentioned. Industrial triple net leases. Got it. Are your investors, are they typically interested in one segment or another, or how does that work? Like if you have a deal, are you kind of blasting it to your entire network or like what's your investor relations kind of approach, I guess, is where I'm going? Yeah. So when we have a new contact or a new lead that comes into our ecosystem, we generally hop on a call, Zoom or otherwise. And we really get to know like their suitability, right? So what are they accredited, not accredited? What are they looking for? They're looking for cash flow. They're looking for appreciation, yeah. looking for a different market. You get to really try to know and dial in to really serve that customer. But the majority of the investors understand the multifamily aspect, right? The investing thesis behind that 
is people need food, clothing, and a place to live, right? Self-storage makes sense secondarily because we're a consumption-driven society. And we don't want to get rid of the family heirlooms and and Ginny's in fine China, right? So we put it somewhere and then we kind of just forget about it. So they understand that too, right? And then the industrial triple net leases is one of the newer operators that we're working with. But another compelling investment thesis in that absolute triple net leases, the tenant is responsible for the taxes, insurance, and maintenance. So it's a pretty much a cash flow play, 20-year leases, aggressively underwritten for the credit history of of the company with their revenue. So different people, I would say the more experienced investors, limited partners, understand all three asset classes. Yep. The newer type of investor really wants to stick to the bread and butter of multifamily. Got it. And then are the deals that you're doing, are they 506B or 506C? Meaning if it's a B, you can have non-accredited investors. If it's a C, you can advertise, but you have to be accredited. So if somebody's listening to this and they're like, ooh, this sounds interesting, but they're non-accredited, can they reach out to you and get into your database? They can, yes. We do 506B and 506C offerings, and we do have some spots for non-accredited folks, but they fill up fast, right? And that's not a market employee or anything like that. Like literally on a 506B offering, you can take no more than 35 non-accredited folks. And a lot of operators that we work with don't even want to take that many, right? It's just easier to go with the accredited folks. So yeah, they can certainly feel free. As far as the advertising, the 506Cs, we don't do a ton of advertising, if at all, because... We really want our investors to have a relationship with Greg and I, with our cell phone numbers, text us if you have a question. So to blast it out onto social media, I see them all the time and I always get DMs in my inbox. Like, if I don't know you, if I've never talked to you before, like, are you really going to invest $50,000 with me? Right. Probably not. Right. So, yeah, it's more of a organic relationship that we're looking for. Got it. How do you find investors? Like you mentioned, you kind of want to have this more relationship, which I think makes a lot of sense. I kind of act in the same way where I try to keep my investor pool manageable, right? Because if I have a deal, I want to be able to call them and talk to them specifically about that deal versus I know a lot of people, they take the quantity approach and get as many people in that database as possible and then click a button and hopefully they can raise half a million, a million bucks. And, and some people are successful that, like that, right? But I'm like, how do you kind of build that, kind of maintain that engine? So I do a ton of podcasts, right? I have my own podcast. It's called the Passive Income Brothers Podcast. I go on a lot of other shows. I speak at conferences. I go to local meetups. Since I've been doing this a couple of years now, we've gone full cycle on one of our original deals. So people tell a friend, right? They go, oh my God, full cycle. This is a great thing. You got to check this guy out. And there's no better compliment than a referral, right? So. We've also done a lot of outreach to qualified intermediaries, which is for 1031 exchanges, 31 attorneys, CPAs, going to different conferences, not just multifamily conferences, but other yeah. conferences. So you, know, you start to build relationships with folks and all of a sudden you get a call and say, now I'm ready. Because right. they've been their emails and our newsletters and everything else. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. You don't really realize who's watching you, right? In a good way. <laughs> yes. I've had a lot of people reach out to me on LinkedIn that I used to work with or got a recruiting background. So maybe I hired them at another company and they're like, hey, I've been watching your stuff on LinkedIn or whatever. And they're like, I'm interested in learning more about what you're doing. So yeah, it's that being out there in front of people makes a lot of sense. I want to kind of talk a little bit more broadly about kind of the market and what you're seeing, because it sounds like you've got kind of the finger on the pulse of a few different asset classes. And we're recording this in kind of early May 23. So we're still in that high interest rate environment. I've seen deal flow slow down dramatically, especially the first quarter of the year. It's starting to pick up a little bit now as far as deals, quote unquote deals kind of being sent out from brokers and things like that. But what are you kind of seeing across your operators? So we've definitely seen a decrease in deal flow, but we, we're still underwriting. We're still pencils up. We just closed on 360 units in Dallas, Texas last nice. week. So there's a lot of operators that have bought properties, value, say value-add multifamily with what's called bridge debt or variable rate debt. Most of the folks had a rate cap, right? But there's definitely people out there that did not buy the rate cap, or if they did, they haven't raised their net operating income to a point in the journey that they should have by this point, right? So whether it was supply lag and construction materials, couldn't get the renovations done, 
for some reason, when they go to refinance that bridge debt, they're just not hitting that pro forma number. And right. now banks are pulling back on the credit, right? So instead of getting 70% LTV on your terms, you might be getting 55. And short of doing a capital call or a cash in refinance, they got to sell, right? They want to maintain some semblance of respectability in the industry and returns at least their investors' capital. So we're really finding a lot of like off-market shopping around of deals with yeah. the operators. That's what they're talking about to us, at least. What I think remains really strong in the industry, especially in the multifamily, is that the fundamentals are there. Yardy Matrix came out with a report today, the state of the multifamily for the springtime. And the multifamily renter by necessity, B and C class housing, is up 5.1% rents or up 5.1% nationally year over year. The luxury lifestyle renter is up 1.5% year over year. So that's national, right? We all know that real estate is local, location, location, location. But those are both quoted at like 95 to 95.5% occupancy. Yep. So with these apartment buildings, they're filled up. People are paying. Also on the delinquency side, there's only a 2% default rate on CMBS paper and less than 1% on paper held by other institutions. So listen, at the end of the day, is it a resilient asset class? People can understand it. The fundamentals are strong. Absolutely. The big thing right now is people's liquidity with their debt, right? People yeah. with fixed rate agency debt are in a great position. People with variable rate debt, there might be some opportunity coming up. Yeah. I talked to a couple of brokers yesterday and they're kind of echoing the same sentiments that you are. And I actually have had a property manager reach out to me that I've been working with in saying, hey, if you're keep your eyes open because there may be an off-market scenario coming, one of their operators, one of their owners is not doing well with a property. So they may have to exit. So I think the stress is starting to build. And I think to your point, if you are in a situation where you've got variable rate debt and you haven't hit the metrics or the hurdles to refinance, you got to do something, right? You either have to sell it to your point or do some type of capital call or capital loan to keep that property in motion. So I guess, what do you think is kind of the rest of 23 going to look like? Obviously, you don't have a crystal ball. If you do, maybe let me know what that looks like. But how do you think the kind of the rest of the year is going to be from a deal flow and from an opportunity standpoint? Well, I wish I had that crystal ball, but it's... <laughs> Uh, listen, 15% of the $2 trillion of commercial real estate paper is coming due by 2025, right? It's a big number. Yeah. So it's going to be opportunity. People are going to realize, hopefully they're realizing early on that maybe they're not trending in the right direction and yeah. they will going to really sell, right? So there's going to be opportunity out there. We're hearing cap rates in some of the sexy markets like Phoenix and Dallas and Atlanta. They've all gone up by maybe 100 basis points, maybe even 150 basis points. What does that mean? I mean, that means we're looking at 15 to 25% price reductions in the value of these properties. Right. As everybody knows real estate's not marked to market every day. So, but if you have to sell because of your debt situation, those are the types of discounts that we're seeing. That 360 door deal we did last week, that was approximately a 20% discount from what they were going to be getting last year. And they turned down a wow. deal on the property last year. So listen, there's still a bid ask spread between the buyers and sellers of yeah. these properties, but there is some pain out there. Is it going to be the pain that we hear about on the mainstream media? I tend to think not so much. Maybe in the office space, maybe in some open air retail, closed end retail, something like that. I could see that happening. On the other end, I've become a macroeconomic nerd over the last couple of years. And from everything that I read and subscribe to, I mean, look, the interest rate turned on the short end or inverted. There's a liquidity crisis brewing, right? I tend to think that by the end of this year or beginning of 24, we're going to see some sort of relief in interest rates. We have a presidential election coming up. So I think if you can, you know, people are saying survive till 25. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking survive till 24. And I think there'll be some opportunity on the other side. Yeah. I'm curious about, since you have like different asset classes that you look at, are you seeing storage sort of something that's always intrigued me because I don't have that in my portfolio, nor do I have triple net lease, but that's kind of not something that I've really desired or looked into enough. But are you seeing either triple net lease and or storage fare better, whether it's from like an operations and a cash flow perspective or just from a deal flow? Because obviously I'm only trying to really tracking kind of multifamily at this point. So self-storage is interesting because they talk about the four Ds, right? Death, dislocation, divorce, mm -hmm. and I'm forgetting the other D. But listen, like there's reasons why people need self-storage. It's desirable, yeah. easy. 
And if you start out at like a 10 by 10 closet at like 89 bucks a year, call it 90, and the rent goes up by, I don't know, 5%, I, that's, now you're going to pay 94.50, right? And it's on your debit card. It's ACH. Yeah. Account. It's just easy to kind of forget, right? But there's some organic growth that can happen very quickly in self-storage. We also use a partner that looks for mom and pop owners that have, don't have systems and processes, a land footprint that can sustain an addition onto the existing. Oh, so more of a development side play. Some development in there as well. So where we are in self-storage, I really like it. I mean, we did, we've done a $100 million fund. We participated with them, two of them so far. They're paying. They have fixed rate debt. I mean, it's really kind of a nice play. The industrial side, it's really a recapitalization of their business, right? So businesses that usually take these industrial sites, I, you know, I'm making this up, but they make the styrofoam that goes in between the airplane doors or they make Got the it. ball rings for some sort of doodad, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a very highly specific company that's in this warehouse. And a lot of times companies will get a line of credit from the bank or they might refinance a lot of their debt. But in this kind of environment, what happens is they can sell their real estate because it might be beneficial with cost to do a sale of the real estate instead of a recapitalization of their Mm -hmm. business paper, right? So they'll sell the real estate to us. We'll lease it back to them at a 20-year commercial lease with agreed upon rent bumps. And it's a triple net lease. So we talked about that, right? They take care of the taxes, insurance, and the maintenance. But in case they don't have a maintenance company or roof leaks and they need somebody... The group that we've partnered with, they have a construction arm, right? So they'll do the construction, they'll do the maintenance, and we'll just bill it back to them. So there's a recurring revenue stream that we can build into a model like that. So it works well. It's more of a cash flow play than it is appreciation. Right. We're buying these things at maybe seven and eight caps at this point. So it'd be interesting to see what happens on the other side. Yeah. Interesting. We may have to talk offline about that. <laughs> it's always fun to have these conversations. Hopefully my audience gets a lot out of it, but I definitely get a lot out of it. Each guest that I have on, I guess I want to kind of just go back in time a little bit, even though you are still working. So I wouldn't call you like you're probably full-time in both at this point, but if you're kind of put your head, hat on that, you're a W2 worker sitting in an office all day, right? You're making good money and maybe you love your job or you hate it, but you really want to find other avenues to invest. Like, what do you think is a good way for somebody to kind of get started? Obviously, if they're listening to this podcast, they already have at least some semblance of, hey, I think real estate's interesting, but I don't know where to start because we've talked about three asset classes. There's a ton of other options for investing in real estate, whether you want to be active or passive. But what do you think is a good kind of starting point for somebody to kind of just get the ball rolling, kind of like what we did in 2018, 2019? Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I got started with the threeplex. Had I known about multifamily syndication, I may have never done that threeplex, right? Because yeah. I may have taken that money and just put it right into a passive deal and I would have been happier than you know what, right? A lot of the stuff that I hear on social media or on podcasts is like, oh, I want you to quit your job with real estate. Listen, I know a lot of my investors, they love what they do. They're not looking yeah. to leave their jobs, but they're looking for that other income. They're looking to put their money soldiers to work, right? Yeah. And that's what those are people that I hope to serve. So I would say, look, find an asset class that really resonates with you. If it's multifamily, great. If it's self-storage, great. If it's single family rentals, listen, there's turnkey single family rentals all over the country. Yep. I would say find an asset class that makes sense to you, that you can understand, and then go all in. Go on the education side. But listen, you don't need a PhD to take action, right? As long yep. as you get 80% of the information, that's my threshold, at least. Once yeah. I know it, of something, I just do it, right? Because there's analysis paralysis that can set in. And listen, like there's companies like mine, like yours, that do this for a living and it works, right? I mean, I've been able to leave my nursing career behind and not think twice about it because yeah. most of the deals that I do with my own money, and I've been able to build an income stream that, look, New York City firefighter is a dangerous job, right? If I have to leave yeah. tomorrow, at least I know that I have other income streams coming in. And yeah. I'll just leave the story real quick. One of my investors is a physician, is a partner in a surgical center, great lifestyle, big house, beautiful yeah. car, beautiful family. And he could afford to do it, right? COVID hits and he's told by the state that he can no longer do elective procedures, emergency procedures only, but his medical specialty, a lot of them are elective procedures, right? Got it. So, I mean, this guy had everything, right? And he realized, and he tells me all the time, he goes, I didn't even know that I needed what you had, right? So just an anecdotal story real quick. 
Yeah. A lot of people, and especially on like the social medias of the world, they talk about financial freedom, right? And I think that term is ambiguous enough that it gets people really excited about the freedom aspect. I talk about like financial foundation and it's kind of like you have additional streams of income coming in from passive investments, whether it's the stock market is passive, right? You can get money from that if you do dividend investing, or if it's like real estate and all that, because it gives you that flexibility for you, you were able to say, okay, well, I've got this other streams of income coming in. I can leave my nursing job because I have active income coming in from being a firefighter and I've got passive income coming in. And so that takes that weight off of your shoulders of being like, well, I need this job because I've been doing recruiting for 16 plus years, both in corporate and helping other companies. And I've seen people that are hardworking, love their job, they get laid off, right? You are a number on an Excel document in the finance department's eyes. And you may love the company, but if they need to make costs or they need to communicate good numbers to the street, you could be gone, right? So having this financial foundation of other income streams is powerful, right? Whether it's a thousand bucks a month or 10,000 bucks a month, doesn't really matter. At least it's something you can kind of just rely on as far as that goes. So I want to kind of transition to the final phase of the conversation. And it's a three pack of questions that I ask every guest. So what's one piece of advice that got you started or helped you along your real estate investing journey? One piece of advice, I guess it's education time to action, right? It came from my mentor. So many times people think like, oh, I want to get involved in real estate. And the first thing they do is grab their smartphone and they go to Zillow and they start typing in a market. And I'd argue that's probably the fifth or the sixth step that you have to do, right? You have to find a team. You got to understand the vehicle, the asset class, the sub market. You got to do a lot of stuff before you line up a property, right? right? So it's a lot about education, right? Lean into it. Listen to podcasts. Listen to audiobooks. There's no shortage of them. I got started with Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, which is a phenomenal podcast. I still listen to it every week on Monday morning. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The Cash Flow Quadrant, Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. I mean, those are some of the books that got me started and got me hooked. Yeah. Well, you kind of answered the next question, I think, but what's your favorite real estate or business book that you're reading right now? Oh, man, there's so many. I guess one of the ones that really stuck out to me was Why Doctors Don't Get Rich. And that was written by Dr. Tom Burns. He's a orthopedic surgeon who basically stumbled upon multifamily and has now built out a very, very nice lifestyle by doing exactly what we're talking about today. So yeah, you don't have to be a physician to read that book. Basically, it's applicable to any sort of W-2 profession, but Why Doctors Don't Get Rich is a great read. That's interesting. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I hadn't heard of that. So last question, if you hit your financial freedom number, meaning you can live an amazing life just off of the passive income generated from real estate, what would you do? I would continue to coach my girls' teams, watch dance recitals, and live the healthy life that my wife and I try to lead. Because what I found was that I desirous of time freedom and freedom with my family and doing what I want to do when I want to do it with whom I want to do it. You know, so... Yep. That's the name of the game for us. No, I love that. That's awesome. Tim, really appreciate the time. It's been awesome kind of learning. And I could, we could have probably talked for another hour about some of the stuff that you're working on. But how can people find you and reach out if they want to learn more about what kind of investments you're doing and all that? Yeah, you can call me on my phone. It's 516-521-7762. My website is citysidecap.com. And my podcast is the Passive Income Brothers Podcast. And if you can't find me in one of those, just Google Tim Lyons Real Estate, and I'm sure you'll have no problem tracking me down. Got it. We'll have all that information in the show notes. I really appreciate it, Tim. It's been awesome catching up for sure. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. Awesome. I hope everybody took something away from this episode. I've got another one dropping soon, so keep listening. See ya. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please like and comment. I read every comment as it helps me serve you better. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you won't miss out on more valuable content. If you're watching this video, it means that you want to grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.